folks in the back can't hear me, put your hand up, I'll speak a little louder. Is there anyone here who does not know who Francis Marion is or was? Well, that makes this talk a little easier. As, as you know, uh, in 1780, when the British took over South Carolina, he organized the resistance and for many months was the only person basically leading a resistance. Um, and so he becomes very important. Somebody can't do that without having some training and background. You don't just become a military uh, leader overnight. And so what we're going to do is explore some of the things that led or allowed him to, to perform this role. That's me. Yeah. I'm going to start by defining a few terms because we really have to understand those terms to understand what's going on. The first term is militia. And in 1760 and 1780, militia was all males between 16 and 60. You were required to show up to four drills per year. You were taught very basic military skills like how to fire a musket, how to uh, march back and forth and that sort of thing. Not a lot, but some. The next group of soldiers in South Carolina were provincials. Now, these, were, um, these were soldiers that were raised by the governor. The governor appointed the officers. They were trained as regular British troops would have been trained. Uh, they had uniforms which the militia generally didn't have. They enlisted for a period of years or months uh, as opposed to serving for six months or 90, 90 days as the militia did. Um, the officer corps was appointed by the governor. The idea was you appointed officers who had standing in the community, who were important men in the community, and the thought was they could then attract enlisted soldiers, and once they got the, on duty, the, the uh, British would train them to be uh, proper officers. Now that might sound kind of strange by today's standards, but in fact that's the way the British Army trained its regular officers at that period of time in the 1760s and earlier, and quite frankly throughout the 18th century, if you were a British officer, you bought your commission and learned your, your trade on the job. Uh, the regular line officers, of course, were uh, full-time professional soldiers. Uh, they showed up from time to time in the militia, not in the militia, but in the, in the colonies. And the, the, uh, they were taught a very set form of fighting, which this slide really depicts. The soldiers were from the dregs of society. The weapons were not very accurate. So what they did is they lined the soldiers up 3D, shoulder to shoulder, and in European fashion, they'd find a big open field. The other side did the same thing. You can see here the sergeant, and his job is to make sure the men are in a nice straight line uh, and don't move, and they would present their weapons. No word for aiming in the manual of arms. You presented your weapons, you fired, and then you used the bayonet to charge across the field, and the, the, the troops that had the best discipline uh, generally won. Now, uh, another term is the flank, which is the side. Every, every army has a side, and you're vulnerable on your flank because if the enemy gains your flank or your side, they can fire down your entire line, and you cannot present weapons to, to re repel that. The last military unit I want to talk about is are the Rangers. The Rangers initially were um, recruited from the locals, and they basically main, maintained the frontier forts. Uh, they're not rangers as we thought, uh, we think of them as today. All right, so, one of the most successful, I hope you can all read this and take this down. <laughs> one, one of the most successful rangers was Robert Rogers from New Hampshire. He was so successful, the British Army uh, told him to write down his rules for rangers, which is what this is. There is outside uh, where the muskets are, a copy of this, and you can get it on the internet by Googling uh, Rogers' Rules for Rangers. <laughs> Not Robert's Rules of Order, which is parliamentary. Um, the other factor that's going to come in here are the Cherokee Indians. This is an early printed Cherokee Indians, and a ambush by those Indians, which this drawing on a powder horn depicts. <laughs> 
this guy here who is General Grant who will run a campaign against the Cherokee Indians. And that is the extent of my slides. Right. If you could bring up the lights. At the height uh, of the uh, colonial era, we have what we call the French Indian War. This was in 1754. Prior to this, the colonies were pretty much neglected by England. In 1754, there is this battle between the French and the English for control of North America. And the British, for the first time, send lots of troops over here to try to hold on to their colonies. Now, these troops come from all of the uh, prejudice of having fought in Europe in open fields as those formal troops I showed you. That's the way they fought battles, that's the way they thought battles should be fought. The colonists, on the other hand, had over a hundred years of fighting Indians, and they fought entirely different. They fought from behind trees, they had aimed fire, they didn't stand up in lines. General Braddock of the British Army decides that he's going to push the French out of what is today Pittsburgh. They had built a little fort out there in the western part of Pennsylvania. He gets together an army of roughly 1,500 guys, and they march out towards Pittsburgh to drive out the French and Indians. And they are attacked, they're ambushed, uh, and Braddock forms his men in the best British form possible, nice straight lines, and they volley fire into the woods with no effect. The provincials decide that they're going to fight Indians their way. They start to break out of lines. They get behind trees to fire. The regulars force them back into lines. They figure these provincials are cowards. They won't stand in a line and fight. And uh, the result is of Braddock's group, only 500 return to tell the tale. He's pretty much wiped out. He is killed. He is buried in the road. The army marches over his body so the Indians will not dig him up and uh, mutilate the body. His successor, Jeffrey Amherst, decides there needs to be a change in tactics. And what they come up with is a concept of light infantry. The light infantry were going to be trained as the provincials fought. They would be the smallest men in the unit, they would be the smartest men in the unit, they would be the best shots in the unit, they would be people who could act independently, and they would be fought, they would be trained to fight by taking cover behind trees picking their targets, often armed with rifles rather than muskets. They would be out ahead of the army, they would be on the flanks, they would protect the main army from ambush in the woods. The best man in the woods was Robert Rogers, major from New Hampshire. And knowing this, Amherst tasked him with writing out his rules of ranging, how, how to behave and fight in the woods, which he did. Amherst then sent 50 of his officers to Rogers to learn how to fight Indians, regular officers. And these men were trained and they were sent back to the line units to form these light infantry companies that would fight uh, Indian style, basically, uh, in the woods as part of the regular British Army. The light infantry was then incorporated into the line units and became a specialty branch of the regular army in 17. 54 to 1760, this was the avant-garde. This was the new thing. These were the shock troops for the British Army. All right, now we're gonna step back for a minute. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Francis Marion, then we're gonna come back to history. At 16, Francis Marion was required to register for the militia. At 16, he went to sea. I don't know if there's a cause and effect thing there, but, but he went to sea, he was shipwrecked, uh, spent a number of days in a lifeboat and saw of six men who got into the lifeboat and the dog. The dog didn't survive very long, he was eaten. Two of the men died and the four, including Francis, were eventually rescued. He learned something from this. He learned a number of things. One, he didn't want to be a sailor, that was the first thing he learned. The second thing he undoubtedly learned was navigation because he was very well connected and given his family connections, there's no way he would have gone to sea as a common sailor. He was undoubtedly going to see to learn how to be a ship's master. The other thing he learned is he learned about men in distress, and he learned to face his own mortality. Uh, and these are things that later in life, we learned that he would never uh, use roads. He went in straight lines across the swamp. He seemed to find his way best at night, dark, moonless nights when the stars were up. He was navigating. 
and the courage that he had that he displayed in later life undoubtedly was as a result of having come to grips with his own mortality in a life of now, going back for a second um, to world history, Cherokees fought with the British during the French and Indian War. They fought for them. The French and Indian War comes to an end. The Cherokees are up north, because that's where most of the fighting was, up on the Canadian border. They are coming home through Virginia. There's an altercation between the white settlers and the Cherokees. Cherokees, a bunch of them are killed. Uh, by the white settlers, the Cherokees get home and they decide to wage war. They get home in, in South Carolina because that's where they're from, and they decide to wage war against the civilians in South Carolina. And there is bloodshed across the frontier. Henry Littleton, who is the governor at the time, calls out his militia from South Carolina, marches them off to the, the wilderness. He's very arrogant with, with, the, uh, with the Cherokees about forming a peace treaty. He gets out to Fort Prince George. Francis Marion was not officially part of that, that expedition, but apparently signed on as a volunteer, so he was present. Littleton gets out to Fort Prince George, and he realizes his militia are undisciplined, are um, mutinous, are not equipped, not trained, and are totally incapable of fighting the Cherokees in the, in the wilderness. So Littleton makes a quick treaty with the Cherokees, a very unfair treaty, and he goes home declaring victory. And we've heard that before. What lesson could Francis Marion take away from this? That untrained militia can't fight battles. Discipline is important. And later in his life, he will be known as a rigid disciplinarian. He knows the value of discipline. Next governor up in line, William Bull. He knows that the, the Cherokees are still on the war path. He asks for regular troops from Amherst. Uh, Amherst is the commander in chief of all British forces in North America. Amherst sends a Scotsman, Archibald Montgomery, with 100 and f uh, 104, yeah, 1,400 Highlanders. They immediately march into the woods. Uh, they, they burn all of the Indian villages that are close to the settled areas, what are known as the lower villages. They put all the Indians they could find, men, women, and children, to death. Um, this, is, this is cleaned up in the press that say we don't kill women and children, but in fact they did. He starts to move into the what's called the middle Cherokee towns. To do this, he has to go through some defiles in the mountains, some, some, some uh, very narrow areas. He's ambushed there by the Indians. Uh, he gets out of it with enough loss of life that he cannot continue, but he claims that he's the winner because he's standing on the ground and the Cherokees have left, and that's the English definition of winning. Cherokees figure they have won because uh, Montgomery has not been able to penetrate into their, their next group of settlements. Montgomery goes home claiming victory and of course that doesn't last very long. Bull knows that's not gonna last very long, so he raises a provincial regiment that he will control, and Francis Marion is commissioned as a lieutenant in that regiment under Captain William Moultrie, who is commissioned as a lieutenant. And then the two of them go out to recruit along with the other officers, and this is the first time we see Marion's name in print, where he's, he's given a kudos for recruiting his, his company to full strength. The governor starts the provincial regiment out to the western forts to, to defend against the Indians. Um, they get to the Congarees, and all of a sudden, James Grant arrives in Charleston, regular officer, colonel, survivor of Indian massacres, a guy who is a hard-nosed professional service uh, soldier, and he calls the, the uh, provincials at the Congarees to stay there. And uh, they do, they spend the winter there, and it's a horrible winter because although the uh, provincials have all of the best men in the province there as officers, and none of them have ever run a military campaign, and so there are no supplies, uh, there are no tents, there's nothing, and it's a miserable winter, and Francis Marion learns his next lesson, 
that is you have to supply your army. You can't just say, we're gonna go on a campaign, you need to have supplies. Harry Lee, during the revolution, would comment that Marion's entire uh, attention was consumed with getting supplies for his men and annoying the enemy. So the importance of supplies was not lost on Francis Marion. Grant arrived with two light infantry companies from the 17th Regiment, regular regiment, two light infantry companies from the 22nd Regiment, uh, a bunch of regular troops, and a detachment of Rogers Rangers, uh, commanded by a Lieutenant Farrington, complete with Stockbridge and Mohawk Indians. He came with about 1,262 men. The first thing Grant does is he starts to work on supplying the expedition. He gathers horses and provisions, and he works on, on creating a forward base. 220 of the best provincials, including Marion, are sent to 96 with 50 wagon loads of, of uh, flour. They would be followed by three other wagon trains of provisions out to 96. Now 96 is described as a fort, but all 96 is at this, this time is a barn sur surrounded by a palisade fence, which is nothing more than a bunch of stakes with sharp, sharp tips. So that when Moultrie and Marion get out there, the first thing Moultrie wants to do is to enlarge the area so they can put more material in there and he entrenches it, digs a ditch to strengthen this fort. Uh, even in its poor condition, 96 has already repelled two Indian seizures in the last several months at the time Marion gets there. And its men have been ambushed when they go out to hunt. So it's a dangerous area. The road to 96 is hardly worth calling a road. Each of the groups that go out comment on how difficult the, tri the trip out is and how they, every time it rains, the road washes out and they have to constantly build bridges. They have to constantly cut down trees. They are building the road as they go, each time each group goes out. And I think if, if Marion learned a lesson from this, it was how difficult it is to supply a military force at 96, which the British will try to do in the next war, and how horrible the rains can be and what nasty things they can do to the roads. Well, of course, you folks here know about rain, uh, so I don't have to tell you about that. When F French keeps a diary, the, the, the uh, captain of the, the light infantry, Marion kept the diary, actually, but that diary is lost. But French exists. And it's kind of interesting because he describes that road and how difficult it was. He also says when he gets out to 96, the first thing that greets him is this howling of wolves. Wolves are everywhere. Every night they hear the wolves. And the wolves are coming right into the camp. Uh, so they have a lot of trouble with wolves. And the second night that they're there, the uh, Chickasaw Indians, who must have gone out with Moultrie, and the Mohawk Indians, the Stockbridge Indians, who were Mohegans actually, all get together. And uh, the Chicksaws want to have a war dance, so they build a big bonfire. And they look over at the Mohawks and they say, well, they're polite Indians, you know? So they invite the Mohawks and the Stock Virginians to dance with them. And after a little bit of difficulty communicating, they figure out what they want to do. So they all get together and they build a bonfire and they dance around and holler and move the way Indians do. And they did this every couple of nights. Um, I can imagine that must have sounded kind of good. Grant arrives in 96 with the rest of the, the troops, and he reorganizes. The first thing he does is he takes the commander of the light infantry from the 17th Regiment, followed by the name of Quentin Kennedy. Kennedy is one of these 50 guys that went to learn rangering from Robert's Rangers. In fact, he gets so hung up in this that he dressed as an Indian and went out with the Indians to raid. So he's, he's a really bound-to-mo type of guy. They give Kennedy all of the Indians, they give him Rogers Rangers, they give him half the light infantry from the 17th Regiment, and they give him uh, about uh, 20 or 30 guys that are used to Indian fighting from the provincials, and they form an Indian Corps. The next thing Grant does is he's a big proponent of light infantry. Because he's lost half his light infantry and his Indians to the Indian Corps, he forms a light infantry company from the provincials. And According to, to doctrine, which Grant's a big guy for, he would have picked the smallest, most agile, the best shots, the people who were able to act independently, the cream of the crop out of the provincials to be his light infantry guys. And William Moultrie is picked to command that, and Francis Marion 
and followed by the name of Crawford are the two lieutenants. So they are the cream of the crop from the provincials. They undoubtedly are trained in light infantry tactics because it makes no, no sense to give somebody a title and not train them. It was British doctrine to train once you gave somebody a title. They probably would have been trained by either uh, Kennedy or by Farrington from the Rangers, but they would have been trained in Robert Rangers, Robert Rogers' rules of ranging, and they would have been trained in light infantry tactics, which called for the light infantry to go out ahead of the main unit with rifles, preferably, uh, to engage the enemy fighting from tree to tree or from a secured position, uh, to act as skirmishers to protect on the flanks and on the front of, of the main column. These are tactics, and if you read out there the rules of ranging, these are tactics that Francis Marion would use later during the American Revolution. Um, and you repeatedly see this in his later campaigns. When Grant moves west, he does not take wagons. Marion never took wagons with him. He puts all of his supplies of pack horses. I understand there was some, some reports say as many 600 pack horses. There was 2,600 men. Uh, and a herd of cattle that went with them for supplies, that column probably stitched over four miles in length when you put it on paths that are too narrow for wagons. The line of marches, the Indian Corps came first. They're out there scouting. You're out looking for danger. The next unit out was the Provincial Light Infantry with Moultrie and Marion. The regular light infantry, the regular line troops, you know, the guys that fight shoulder to shoulder, the provincial troops, the pack horses, the cattle, and the rear guard, which were provincials. They go through the territories of the, uh, the, the Cherokee territories, the lower towns first. They, they see the burnt out villages. Uh, they come upon many areas that would have been good for ambushes. And they don't know whether there's Indians there or not, so every time they come to a place that's good for an ambush, they have to scout it out. And who's doing this? The light infantry is doing it. And they're doing it in rotation, because it's such a dangerous job. They're doing it in rotation. Sometimes Marion, sometimes French, sometimes other officers who were light infantry officers. It took a lot of guts to do, but that's what they did. When they get to Fort Prince George, one night the whole group is alarmed by this horrible noise. I can't figure out what it is at first. And what's happened is the wolves have gotten into the cattle pen. So the cattle are making a lot of noise. The wolves are making a lot of noise. And French says there was a vast howling of wolves. And at the same time, there was a big war dance with the Chicksaws, the Catawbas, the Mohawks, and Stockbridge. And he says, our Indians screaming at the same time, making it impossible to tell what it was. So I just visualize this at night, the bonfires, the screaming, the wolves. It had to be a horrible and uh, disturbing set of events. Later in the Revolution, Marion would have Indians in his, his unit in the brigade, and the British would complain that they would hoop and holler all night long. So Marion, knowing how uh, disquieting that could be, made no effort to control that behavior on the part of his troops. He probably even encouraged it. We come to June 10th, and Grant's army is approaching the place where the ambush took place with Montgomery the year before. And uh, again, the light infantry is out front. Ahead of them are, is the Indian Corps. And just as they're clearing their last campsite, uh, shots ring out against the cattle with the rear of the column. And this is a diversionary attack. There's a few shots ring out. Grant sends 50 troops back from the provincials to protect his rear. In the meantime, uh, the main body has come to this place that is very, very narrow uh, on the right is a mountain. On the left is a stream that cannot be forded at that point in time, and a mountain above that. It is so difficult that horses are having a hard time getting through. This is what in military terms we call the killing zone. This is, a, this is where they're going to have the ambush, but this is the killing zone. It's where the British column and the Grant can't maneuver. They're just stuck there. They're like fish in a barrel. But fortunately, Kennedy is out there on the flank with his Indian Corps, and he turns up the Indians that are waiting in the ambush. And there's some firing between the Cherokee and, uh, and between him and uh, Kennedy. 
and he sort of Kennedy flushes them out. Uh, and when the Indians figure they have been discovered, there's a war hoop that goes up and down the whole length of Grant's column from the Cherokee on both sides of the river, and the fighting begins. Grant knows he cannot fight, he can't deploy, he doesn't try to deploy. His tactic is to get his men as quickly as possible out of this kill zone. And so he, he tells his light infantry up front, you've got to push ahead. So he has uh, Kennedy on the mountains, engaging the Indians, preventing them from firing down into the column, the Indians across the river at a little bit too great a distance for effective fire. And in the front of the column, the light infantry is tasked with pushing through the Indians in front of the column because Grant has now been attacked on four sides, pushing through the Indians blocking the front of the column to push a half mile ahead to where there's a ford across the river, to seize the ford at the river, to cross the river, to establish a base on the other side of this, the river, to seize the hill that overlooks that ford, and to protect the main army as it crosses the river. And to this, the light infantry is charged, and to this, the light infantry applies themselves with great vigor, and they are successful. They break through the Indian in the front. Kennedy keeps them, as, uh, as French would say, amused on the side. And uh, they cross the river, and the column gets out of the, the ambush trap. Uh, five officers are wounded, 47 men are killed or wounded. They lose 40 horses, and the bulk of the casualties are in the provincials but French relates that his men have behaved, our men, he says, have behaved bravely, returned their fire, the Indians' fire, advanced briskly up the hills, and pushed forward with great intrepidity across the river. Um, Marion was part of this, and in his diary, he says he's the guy that forced down the road, he's the point of the spear that forces the way through the Indians in the front of the column, and there's absolutely nothing to indicate that was not the case. Neither Grant nor French nor anybody else who writes records the names of the officers who were in charge of the columns of the light infantry who pushed through for the main column. But we know that did occur. And uh, we know from James that Marion had done something of great uh, importance during the French and Indian War, but nobody could remember by James's time what that was. So what did Marion learn out about all of this? Well, he learned about ambushes. And he learned how to get out of ambushes because he saw how Grant did it. He learned the importance of having your men properly supplied. He learned about not fighting on the enemy's grounds, pick your own ground. He also learned, it's interesting, when he had ambushes, he frequently would attack on more than one side. But he never attacked on four sides because he said if you attack on four sides, men, if they think they cannot escape, will sell their lives dearly. He always wanted his enemy to be able to think there was a way of getting away. Marion learned about killing fields. He learned about the difficulty of crossing a river under fire. And if you remember in the Bridges campaign, he always forced the British to cross rivers under fire. And that's something anybody who has been in the infantry knows, crossing a river under fire is probably one of the hardest things for an infantryman to do. So Marion learned a lot of this campaign, and you see those lessons applied later uh, during, the, during the revolution. <clears throat> After this one ambush, uh, the Cherokee basically fall away. The battle lasted from 8.30 till noontime, and it was sporadic fighting for about two hours afterwards. But after this one battle, there's not much resistance to Grant. And Grant goes forward into the Indian towns, and he orders all the towns burned. He orders all the crops torn up. He orders all the men, women, and children found to be killed. The reality is the Indians have already evacu evacuated most uh, of their people from the towns. The troops come across two women, one warrior and one old man, who are all tortured and killed by the friendly Indians. Later, Andrew Pickens would say that he learned from his campaign how cruel the British really were. Marion wrote a letter home, which I believe is, is, is a true letter. Um, some people dispute it, but it appears in Sims' work, and Sims had the benefit of having, having Boree's uh, manuscript in front of him. I will read the letter because it's indicative of 
of who Francis Marion was. He writes, we, we arrived at the Indian towns in the month of July, and as the lands were rich and the season had been favorable, the corn was bending under the double weight of uh, lusty roasting ears. We encamped the first night in the woods near the fields where the whole army feasted on the young corn, which was fat, which with fat venison made a most delicious treat. The next morning we proceeded by order of Colonel Grant to burn down the Indian cabins. Some of our men seemed to enjoy this cruel work, but to me it appeared shocking sight. Poor creatures, thought I, we surely need not grudge you such miserable habitations. But when we came according to orders to cut down the fields of corn, I could scarcely refrain from tears. I saw everywhere around the footsteps of little Indian children where they had lately played under the shelter of the rustling corn. No doubt they had often looked up with joy to the swelling stalks. When we are gone, I thought they will return, and peeping through the weeds with tearful eyes will mark the ghastly ruins poured over their homes and the happy fields where they had so often played. Who did this, they will ask, their mothers? The white people, the Christians did it, will be the reply. There's a lot of bitterness in that letter. Uh, Marion was a farmer. Grant would boast that he destroyed 1,400 acres of crops, that he burned 15 towns and put 5,000 people into the woods to starve. He was happy about that. He boasted about that. Different person than Francis Marion. The last lessons Marion learned, he learned how the British waged war. And when it came to South Carolina during the Revolution, they were not much different treating white folks than they had treated Indians. The main difference is they didn't kill the women and children, but they hung a lot of guys. And probably the very last thing Francis Marion learned, as a soldier, you have to live with what you've done. And as he went forward to the American Revolution, he urged upon his followers not to engage in needless cruelty. cruelty. And he, at the end of the war, urged everybody to stop the fighting and to forgive those who had been involved. And that's my talk. Thank you. Was there any relationship between the grant and, and uh, the Civil War grant? I, I doubt it. Um, the, the grant from, uh, the general grant of Grant's campaign was an uh, Englishman who went home to England after the American Revolution. He disliked tremendously Americans. He thought they were all cowards. He had very low appear, uh, uh, opinion of, of American soldiers. And I, you know, he was governor of Florida for a while, but he did not stay in the United States. Thank you. Yes. Do we know where Fort Prince George is? Well, yeah, it, well, right now it's under a lake. Yes, they do know where it is. But it's, it's an area that's been covered by water. Karen? Yeah. Did Marion's troops always wear uniforms? No. Mar the question was, did Marion's troops always wear uniforms? Uh, and the answer to that is, is no. When he was a in the provincial regiment during the French and Indian War, the men wore uniforms. When he was a militia uh, before that, they didn't wear uniforms. When he became a continental soldier, the men wore uniforms when they had them. Uh, during the time he was a partisan, the men came with whatever they had. Towards the end, so I mean, some men had uniforms and some didn't. Towards the end of his partisan career, uh, towards the end of the war, he did put out an order for the, the men in his brigade to wear uniforms, and he actually designated different colors for different companies. Whether or not they actually were able to put that into effect, I don't know, but there was an order for them to do that. The uniforms would have been very simple, though, in the back. How old was the Gary campaign? How, he had been about 28 uh, during the Cherokee War, and that was the first fighting he'd seen. He'd gone with Littleton before, but there was no fighting. So this was the first time he actually saw fighting. Other questions? Yeah. Grant, Murray, uh, I think Amherst, Montgomery, these were all some of uh, Cumberland's men in the rising in Scotland in 1845 and had participated in the punishment of the rebels in Scotland. You mean 1745? 1745, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
see anything, any connection perhaps between what these people did in Scotland and what they're doing to the Cherokee? Well, he, he, yeah, the question is, is there any connection between the way that these uh, the British officers treated the Scots in Scotland and the way they treated the Cherokees? They were miserable to everybody, all right? They, they were uh, committed genocide against the Scots, quite frankly. And then at the beginning of the French and Indian War, they decided that there was a bunch of French in Acadia in, in Nova Scotia that were supposedly French neutrals, and they decided they didn't like them. And so they basically committed genocide against the Acadians when they went in, gathered them up for no particular reason, scattered them all over the world, uh, just burned their homes, destroyed all their livestock. Same deal as they did with the Cherokees. Um, and if you read the accounts of the numbers of those guys, those folks, men, women, and children who died. Uh, it was genocide, there's no doubt about it. Some of those uh, Acadians were settled in, or not settled, they were deposited in South Carolina where they were put to work on the plantations a little better than slaves. So the British had a long history of being absolutely miserable to people they didn't like. And they were miserable to the Cherokees, given the fact that Cherokees had been their allies in the French and Indian Wars. They were miserable to the Acadians who had, had pledged neutrality. Uh, in fact, the interesting thing with the Acadians is the reason that they were deported is they would not take an oath of allegiance to the British king. Um, and if you look at what happened in South Carolina, uh, we have a militia that surrendered at Charleston, and then they refused to take, some of them refused, but they were asked to take the oath of allegiance to the king, and the minute they did, they were then required to fight for the king. So, I mean, you have a repetition of conduct, which is absolutely horrible. Um, and Weems, in his book, uh, has Marion saying something which probably was said, and that is, uh, at some point, uh, Gates is defeated, Marion has been working with the Williamsburg militia, uh, Marion realizes how bad the defeat of Gates is, Sumter was uh, defeated about the same time, uh, so Marion's all alone, and he decides he's going to withdraw to North Carolina for a while, and his men, get, this is a big groan, they really don't want to go, but Marion knows he, he has to go. But he, he has this conversation that Williams puts into his, his mouth, which I think may actually be true, he says, we'll wait here a little bit, and then they're gonna see what the British do, and once they see what the British do, talking about the population, then they're all gonna support me. And so I, I have a feeling this may be an actual conversation Marion had with his troops, because when he sends people back, what have the British done? They're burning houses, they're destroying livestock, and one of the things, nasty things they would do is they would, uh, when they would go to a farm, they wouldn't just take one or two cows, they'd take everything, you know, and, and they'd leave people with absolutely nothing. Uh, and, and this was called quartering on, on somebody, so, and they wouldn't pay for it. So there was, there, there, you know, they just treated everybody miserably. And part of the problem with the American Revolution is Great Britain now is our very best friend in the world. And they were our very best friend for two world wars. And it's a little hard to teach the American Revolution and teach how really miserable they were during that, that war <laughs> without you know, impinging on a very good friend right now. So, it, it, the revolution is an inconvenient war for modern politics. Uh, other questions? One more and then we have to go. Chris. At Spruce Pine in North Carolina at the Mineral Museum, there is a plaque honoring Francis Marion for clearing out that pass, which would have been Gillespie Pass. Couldn't possibly have been there. I didn't tell them they were wrong. I'd rather them <laughs> honor him someplace wrong than not honor him at all. But uh, obviously, that pass I think Joe Epley will talk about uh, talks about that in the the King's Mountain event, but that's awfully far east. I did not make a study of the geography because I was concerned about the train. We had a very excellent presentation presenter here a number of years ago that did talk about the geography and about where that was. Scott. Yeah. Scott. And he says it's it was uh, much farther west because the Gillespie Pass is at Little uh, Switzerland, just above Marion, North Carolina. There is, um, I'll talk to you offline. In my, in my reading, there was actually a, a notation from somebody who came through a pass, and they said, oh, 
what are all those rocks there? These are the Indian graves from the from the, uh, the battle. But we'll talk about that offline. Okay. Thank you. I, I, offline, they have to move forward. I'm getting up. <laughs> One last question. Well, I just wanted to. I, I ran with Jones and uh, Christine's point. I was just at the Leslie Gap and looking at that very plaque. Etch, Etcho Pass is actually in the South Carolina, uh, well over to the west. Yeah. Uh, but it's the myth of it being there is why Marion, North Carolina, is named Marion. So uh, <laughs> we got a freebie there. <laughs> <laughs> William James calls him Oscar, which may have been his real name. Uh, 
I would, because when he was honored by presidential proclamation in 2006, he was identified as Oscar, but he went by the nickname Buddy. Uh, Buddy has been described as a childhood companion and sort of foster brother to Marion, and he was with him throughout the revolution. A claimed descendant of Oscar Marion describes him not only as a soldier, but as Marion's personal assistant, sous chef, bugler, and oarsman. He apparently also played the fiddle because Marion bought one for him right after the war. Now, Buddy was the son of June, that's a male, who was an overseer for, for Marion, and June's wife, Chloe, who worked as a cook and a domestic. As far as I can tell, June and Chloe were both uh, African Americans, as were Buddy and Buddy's sister, Phoebe. But it's possible they had some mixed blood as well. Uh, Phoebe went on to have a child by a Native American of unknown name. Her daughter, Peggy, was described as a muskie, which at the time usually referred to people who shared African and Native American ancestry as distinguished from those who were a mixture of European and African. Now, probably around the time he acquired Pond Bluff in 1773 or a little after, Marion made out a will that gave preferential treatment to this family of slaves. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but I wanna read you some of the highlights in his original language, which I think uh, has some misspellings which were common back then. But um, anyway, he says, uh, skipping to second, I enfranchise and make free my faithful Negro man named June and my good old nurse Willoughby. I also make free the musty girl Peggy, the daughter of Phoebe. These three slaves, I declare, are free from all bondage and slavery, whatever. I give to my enfranchised slave June 20 pounds sterling per annum as long as he lives. I give and bequeath to my enfranchised slave Willoughby one suit of clothes and 20 pounds per annum as long as she lives. I give and bequeath to my enfranchised slave Peggy, the daughter of Phoebe, Peggy is the musty girl, suitable clothing, that is to say, one winter suit and one summer suit of clothing, each just consist of one gown, one petticoat, and a shift. This donation to be annually till she comes to the age of 15 years, and, and this is important, I order that she be learned to read and write, to be paid out of my estate, and that she shall have a living on my plantation till she arrives at the age of 15. This is sort of a curious document. It frees the slave June, the overseer, but not his wife, Chloe, nor their son, Buddy. Buddy's sister, Phoebe, also remains a slave, but her daughter, Peggy, the musty, is made free. And the provision for Peggy's education was actually contrary to South Carolina law at the time, which made it a crime to teach a slave to write. A hundred uh, sterling pound uh, uh, fine, if you did so. Still, I think it shows uh, the basically humane and generous side of Marion that most of us have come to know and admire him. He evidently had tender feelings for this core group of slaves. Now, as long as we're talking about this group, I want to flash forward to the end of the war and, and then the end of Marion's life. At the end of the war, Marion comes back to Pond Bluff and writes to Peter Maury to say that he's down to, quote, 10 working Negroes. One source, William Body, uh, says that's not including the, the aforementioned June, Chloe, Buddy, Phoebe, and Peggy. According to Body, those five, plus the working 10, voluntarily moved over from Pond Bluff during the war to Belle Isle, the plantation of Marion's late brother Gabriel, who Marion was the guardian for. One of Marion's cousins was running Belle Isle during the war. Although we don't know when they made that move, these, these few slaves, it was probably around the time the British confiscated Marion's Pond Bluff plantation in the fall of 1780. And so then this group, plus the 10 uh, working field hands, went with them back to Pond Bluff after the war. So that's some evidence of loyalty and, and decent circumstantial evidence that Marion was a humane master, which is consistent with his character. Now, if you do the math, that still leaves five or so, maybe 10 slaves who didn't stay with him. What happened to them? Uh, William James says they were taken away by the British which is certainly possible. The British did take a lot of slaves forcibly from Whig plantations. In fact, Marion and his brigade spent a fair amount of time trying to prevent that from happening. 
Uh, but at least one of Marion's slaves, according to British Army records, escaped to the British lines and ended up resettling in Nova Scotia in a settlement called Birchtown, named for the, a British general. And a lot of this escaping activity happened too because the British advertised that any slaves who came over voluntarily would get their freedom at the end of the war. The British didn't always honor that promise, by the way. Uh, now, who knows whether this particular slave app was, was really an ex-slave of Marion. It could be like those dozens or hundreds of soldiers uh, in their pension applications who said they served under Marion. So, but that's, that's what the, uh, the record says. Uh, when Marion died in 1795, his inventory listed him with 74 slaves, uh, comprising over half the value of his estate. Uh, just five years before that, in 1790, in the census, he was credited with 194 slaves. The census wasn't always accurate, so you can take that for what it was. Um, I don't know how to reconcile those two figures, although here's a possible explanation. Uh, as you know, Marion married late in life to his cousin, Mary Vidot, and according to her inventory at death in 1815, she had 44 slaves. And then Francis Dwight Marion, their adopted son, had about 150 slaves at his death in 1833. If you, if you add those two together, you get 194, which could just be a coincidence, or, or maybe there was some uh, shuffling back and forth between Marion and, and Francis Dwight. Uh, now, when Marion died, he had a revised will, which he had made out after his marriage. Uh, in, in 1787, he made a, a new will and he redated it again in 1792. Turns out it wasn't valid, at least as to real property, because it was not witnessed, uh, which was also true of his first will, the one I showed you. But it's still relevant, they're both still relevant to show his intent and state of mind. And what's interesting is that he does not emancipate any slaves in his final will. Not his loyal buddy, who shows up in his inventory as the very first slave, nor Peggy, the musty, who was to have been freed under the original will, and she's still around at his death. Uh, June was also supposed to have been freed too, but I think he had passed on by that time. Uh, same was, I, I believe, true of, of Willoughby. Uh, their no, names don't show, show up. So it's, it's something of a mystery as to why he didn't free any slaves in the final will. There's a couple of theories, uh, one, manumission, that is the, the freeing of slaves by their masters, was becoming increasingly unpopular in the South, including in South Carolina. Uh, by law in South Carolina, in fact, an emancipated slave had to leave the colony within six months or face re-enslavement and sale at a public auction with consequent separation from family. So maybe that played a part in his thinking. But I think probably the reason was similar. He was married now had an adopted son and felt his main loyalty was now, now to them and leaving it to them to free whatever slaves they would choose to or not in, in their wills. Uh, another unanswered question, uh, sort of a, a touchy topic. Uh, did Marion ever whip or authorize the whipping of his slaves? And I'm talking mostly here about his field workers since his core group of Buddy's family, by all indications, were, were treated well. As to the others, there's no specific evidence one way or the other. On the one hand, as we've seen, uh, Marion was a humane and fair man and not the per type of person who would go in for cruel or gratuitous punishment. On the other hand, he was a stern disciplinarian with his soldiers, uh, many of whom were whipped for various misdeeds. Now, when he was in command of the militia during his partisan period, he didn't really have the power to administer corporal punishment to his soldiers. I think there were times when he would have liked to, and he even went so far as to threaten death to anyone found guilty of plundering, whether from black or white. But the militia in 1780 and 81 were, were basically volunteers, and if he, if he was too hard on them, they could just tell him to go take a hike out of here. In fact, he told Peter Ori that a militia commander command was a, quote, skulking position with the commander almost at the mercy of his men. Now that was not true when he was a continental commander earlier in the war from 1775 to early 1780. He had control then and he could and did often order and carry out corporal punishment to his soldiers 
for bad behavior in that time frame, such as 50 or 100 lashes on a bare back. And so I guess my point is, I think we might, I think we'd have to be a little naive to believe that he never ordered a flogging for any of his slaves over whom, after all, he had total control. It would have been the rare slave owner at that time who never did. But in the end, we really don't know. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about his relations with um, uh, Native Indians. You've heard from Karen about the Cherokee uh, Wars. Yeah. I'm not, not going to repeat too much of that. Yes, atrocities were committed, as the British and press in 2000 said, burning of homes, burning of crops, etc. There's no evidence that Marion personally uh, committed any atrocities against the Indians during that time, at least as a matter of choice. Although it's likely that he, that he may have participated in some by order from Grant, as he says in his, in his letter. Uh, as to the letter, uh, you know, whether Marion penned those exact words about um, over here, the poor creatures, I could scarcely refrain from tears, maybe, maybe not. Uh, the, the letter is written in a more flowery style that he employed in his military writings, uh, but, you know, very few of his private writings exist. So it's possible that this highly personal message was in fact his own. It's also possibly relevant that Peter Horry didn't dispute this letter in his written comments on Weems's book. And in any event, I think the sentiments reflected in the letter are similar to those he would express 20 years later when he participated in a war just as vicious and brutal. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's also a matter of record that when he first showed up in General Gates' camp in July 1780 with about 20 volunteers, this is after the fall of Charleston, that he had some black soldiers with him. Uh, some sources say he also had some Catawba Indians who were enemies of the Cherokee. I, I don't want to oversell this. I mean, he, it, this creates the impression that, you know, one-fourth of his brigade was Native American and one-fourth African American. Uh, I, there's really no documentary support for that. Some historians have sort of blithely stated that Marion had lots of free African Americans and Indians fighting for him. I, I don't think the evidence really supports that. In terms of documented examples of, of free people of color serving with him, it's, it's pretty sparse. There's maybe a half a dozen um, who, who show up. Um, but so my guess is in terms of actual free persons of color as opposed to slaves, uh, the number who served in Marion's brigade was pretty small. Nevertheless, even if it's just a few, it does tend to show that Marion at least did not have a reputation as a cruel slave master or an especially uh, virulent racist, or else uh, the, uh, the free African Americans probably would have, would have stayed away from him. I think that Marion did recognize that slaves generally desired freedom as evidenced by his recommendation as part of a legislative committee in 1783 that one Antigua be emancipated. This is someone who Governor uh, John Rutledge had, had promised to make free and who had helped uh, obtain information behind enemy lines frequently at the risk of his own life. Marion's committee recommended that it comply with the promise Rutledge made. In Antigua, his wife and children were liberated from what the General Assembly called, quote, the yoke of slavery. A phrase which sort of refutes the notion that even... Uh, 